Colossians chapter 1, verse 21. Here we go. And you that were sometime alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now has he reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. If you continue in the faith, grounded and settled, and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel, which you have heard, and which was preached to every creature which is under heaven, whereof I, Paul, am made a minister, who now rejoice in my sufferings for you, and fill up that which is behind of the afflictions of Christ in my flesh for his body's sake, which is the church, whereof I am made a minister according to the dispensation of God, which is given to me for you to fulfill the word of God, even the mystery which hath been hid from ages and from generations, but now is made manifest to his saints, to whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory, whom we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus, whereunto I also labor, striving according to his working, which worketh in me mightily. Now we've been preaching on several tapes about the temple of God as being the third aspect that we're discussing of the land of promise or the inheritance or the goal of redemption. First of all, we said deliverance from sin, and then we talked about the forming of Christ in you. And now we're talking about the coming of the Father and the Son to dwell in the temple of God. We're talking about the temple of God. And it's interesting that almost any place you pick up the New Testament and take it a, a cross section of it, you find yourself talking about holiness because that's what the New Testament is about. And notice that at some time, talking to Gentiles, at some time, you are alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now has he reconciled uh, in his fleshly body through death in order to present you before him holy, blameless, and beyond reproach if indeed you continue in the faith firmly established and steadfast. It is so different from what is preached today. It is so different from the grace that uh, people assume the Bible is talking about. It's not talking about grace. It's talking about holiness. And grace is a space given to us to repent and also the power and the wisdom to be holy. But the text, the con content of the Bible, Old Testament and New, is one. It's about godly living. He said, if indeed, it's always conditional. It's always conditional. And the teaching today that grace and salvation are not conditional is, a, is error. It is not true. It is conditional. It is conditional every day. And a, I, I don't need a string of scriptures to impress you here. That's not our, our goal tonight to talk about the unconditionalness of salvation. But it leaps out at you all the time. The warning, the sense of warning. I'm warning you. I'm teaching you. I'm saying that Christ has saved you to make you holy in his sight and, and I'm working on this and I'm teaching you so that I may present you that way. And anything else is a false gospel. And what's being preached today is a modern antinomianism. It's a form of Gnosticism. And, and every sound Christian teacher throughout the church generations has a denounced it. This grace idea that it's unconditional amnesty and Jonathan Edwards denounced it. What was it he called it, Audrey? You were telling me what Jonathan Edwards called it. He, every name he could think of. And uh, because it's wrong, wrong, wrong. So we're in, a, we're in a heretical time. We're in an apostate time. And if we realize that, then we won't say, well, you know, what Thompson is preaching is far out. Someone said that to me the other day. He said, they didn't hear anything of my preaching far out. And I said, of course you didn't hear anything far out. All you heard was historic Christian teaching of holiness and righteousness. But when you put it in a setting like today, an apostasy, it sounds like it's far out. It's not far out. It's apostate. What is being preached today is apostate. 
And what we're, we're, all we're doing is returning to repentance, holiness, righteousness, which has always been the theme of uh, God's uh, theologians. We, American people today um, are not intellectually oriented. They're emotionally oriented. And, and so the preachers lead them off to get money out of them and get them to attend church. And it's just that bad. Uh, that's where we are. If, if you continue in the faith, firmly established and steadfast, and not moved away from the hope of the gospel that you have heard, which was proclaimed in all creation under heaven, and which, of which I, Paul, was made a minister, now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake and in my flesh. I do my share on behalf of his body, which is the church, and filling up that which is lacking in Christ's afflictions. And whenever any God is going to do a work or establish a work, somebody has to pay the price. It, it, it does. They, these things just don't come out of heaven. They, somebody has to stand in the gap, make up the hedge before God so that God can move. And Paul was saying, you know, you're being blessed. That's wonderful. I'm paying for it in my flesh. But that's the way it is. And later, uh, the ministry will get their reward. But now we have to bear whatever God gives us to bear because it is for his body's sake and it's something we owe the Lord. And uh, don't forget that now when you go out to minister. Don't expect uh, people to fall all over you to be lovely and everything. What you're going to run into is an evil nest of vipers. And that has been true of every church since the time of Cain and Abel. It's true today and always will be because... Uh, when you get church people, they're into that area that Satan is interested in, and he infiltrates it, and every ungodly thing on us comes out. And if you try to lead such an undisciplined mass of wild asses cults, uh, you better be prepared for a bumpy ride. And that's true of every church, unless the thing is uh, deceived, lulled to sleep, dead on its feet, or otherwise disillusioned, de depressed, oppressed, and dead. But if you've got a live group of people that are going on with God, then you have a nest of vipers and scorpions, and that's the way it is, and you might as well get used to it. We're all that way. But you don't notice it until you're in a position of leadership. And then it's all directed at you. Uh, people want to be leaders. Oh, if I was pastor. Oh, you know, I can't stand this because I'm not pastor. That's great. Uh, uh, Walter, I was talking to Walter this morning, he called up, checking in, uh, Waller Miller, <laughs> checking in at the 7-Eleven, and uh, he said it, it was amazing to him how smart Audrey and I were getting. He says, each day it seems you're getting smarter. Well, that's what experience will do. It, it, it gives you insight and so on as teaching. Well, try it. You'll love it. All right, now... Uh, 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 the, so there's stuff uh, lacking, and this has to be filled up if you're going to have godliness in God's people because they're going to uh, buck and resist and kick in every turn while they are learning God's way. So don't look at me sweetly. That's the way we are, and uh, that's the way it's going to be. Uh, this church, this thing that God is making, I was made a minister according to the stewardship from God bestowed on me for your benefit that I might fully carry out the preaching of the word of God now, here, Paul is giving us kind of a resume of the gospel, and he gets right to the heart of it. That is the mystery which has been hidden from the past ages and generations, but has now been manifested to his saints. So now he's going to talk about what the gospel is about, what, that it's a mystery, that it's been hidden, and this is what it's about. This is what is central to it, and he said, it is Christ with you, the hope of glory. Isn't that wonderful? Praise the Lord. How many know that's wonderful? Uh, Larry, that isn't wonderful? What's not wonderful about it? What's wrong? Yeah, the preposition. It's a big difference. It's a big difference. Huh? Well, you know, go hungry for three days. And then decide whether there's a difference between the food with you and the food in you. <laughs> there's a big difference between with and in. And it is a mystery. And uh, God was with Israel. And for 2,000 years, Christ has been with the church. But that is not his central goal to be with the church. It is to be in the church. And because that is true, it 
alters the whole complexion of the nature of redemption. Because if God is going to be with us, forgive our sins, and walk with us, and then take us up to heaven today or whenever he's ready to, that's one matter. And we can maintain ourselves pretty much the way we are as long as we do our religious number. But because the gospel is Christ in you, everything changes, everything goes crazy. As God, in the Feast of Trumpets, announces his intention to enter through the everlasting doors. And the everlasting doors are what? The human heart. There's no other everlasting doors except the human heart. And the king comes with the sound of a trumpet to enter in. In Rosh Hashanah, which is the head of the year, which is the beginning of the year of kings and contracts. And that's what we have come today in the Jewish liturgy uh, and in the Christian liturgy, as well as in the Jewish liturgy, Rosh Hashanah comes after Pentecost because after Pentecost, after we are filled with the Spirit, the king stands before us and he says, I am going to enter your personality. And when he does, we are brought into judgment because God and we are trying to occupy the same space at the same time. And, and you get this uh, reconciliation process and God is not going to change. He's not going to change. We have to do all the changing. And so we pray in the hope we can get God to make some concession to our frailties. He makes no concession to our frailties for the simple reason that what he is doing for us is so much greater and grander and, and better in every way than we could ever conceive that in his mercy he keeps us from coming short of his glory. And unless we say, I, I'm going to get out of this program because it's too rough for me, if we will stay in there and let God have his uh, uncluttered way, we are going to arrive at the desire of our heart. That didn't quite sink. Almost. What did I say? I said, if we let God have his way, what? We are going to be thoroughly miserable because God loves it that way. That's exactly what I said. You can hear it on the tape. All right, now let's do it again. If you let God have his unhindered way in your life, and it takes faith and trust, what will happen? You will gain what? Of whose heart? You'll gain the desire, God's desire for you. Well, that isn't what it says, is it? And the Bible means exactly what it says. The desire of your heart. Because the word cannot be broken. Now, God knows what he is doing. And the scripture says he shall give you the desires of your heart. And the word cannot be broken. So God has not come into us to reconcile us to himself because he likes, he likes to always be having his way and depressing and oppressing our desires. That's the way it seems tonight, doesn't it? Well, doesn't it? Yeah? How many are deliriously happy? Hank, <laughs> one or two others, and the rest are kind of grinning and bearing it, mostly bearing it. Yes, thank you, brother. That's true. Mostly bearing it. Now, we may cloud our minds with a lot of doctrine, so when we're in church, we're not thinking about our troubles, but when we go out, they hit us. So instead of clouding our mind, why don't we address what is actually going on, which is we are not getting our own way at this time. <laughs> All right. Now, there is a reason for that is because if we get our own way at this time, we'll never get the desires of our heart. So I know better than God. He doesn't know what the desires of my heart are. Yes, he does. If, if he knows when a sparrow falls to the ground, he certainly knows the desires of your heart when he died on the cross for you, not on the cross for the sparrows, 
but he died on the cross for you. And he knows that you've got to trust him. Come on, come on. Some of you are not trusting now. You say, that's all fine and good, but come on. That's all fine and good, but huh? I have to stay here because the TV camera is here. <laughs> That's all fine and good, but, but God said, he'll give you the desires of your heart. Where? I have no idea. Maybe Thompson made it up. Where does it say it? For I heard everything but the book of Malachi. Where did he make it up? Psalms what? Psalms 37 verse 4. All right. The word cannot be broken. He shall give you the desires of somebody else's heart. He shall give you the desires of his heart. What? Your heart. And the word cannot be broken. Have faith in God. And tell him that you have faith in him. And quit belly aching. Say, God, I have faith in you. I don't feel red hot. <laughs> Somebody has had a terrible day today. What's the matter? I thought all these people were raptured. I expected to have just a corporal's guard here tonight. Where were you people when the trumpet blew, for goodness sake? I talked you out of it, didn't I? <laughs> you missed out, and it's my fault. You know what I think? I think everybody that bought that book should take it back to the Christian bookstore and demand their money back. <laughs> and then maybe the Christian bookstores would, would have some stake and some integrity in what they're doing. Just take them back. Say, I demand my money back. This is false. Well, now, that's just a suggestion. You don't have to know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. I'll say to the church, because I talked to them last night about, that was a suggestion, guys. And don't, no, no, you don't have to do that. All right. He shall give you the desires of your heart, but he's going to do it his way. Isn't that nice? He's going to do it his way and at his time. I'm sure Paul has the desires of his heart now, but for a while it was rough. But God knew it was in Paul's heart. And he says, but it's written, it cannot be broken. He's given Paul the desires of his heart. All right, now we just have to have faith and believe God. And God is not content to walk with us like he did in the garden. But he is going to dwell in us. And therefore, the, the demands on us are total. And we have this constant day in, day out, 24 hour a day, God dealing with this and dealing with that and dealing with the next thing because he is making his way into the depths of our personality and until it becomes thoroughly saturated with Christ, God is not going to be happy. He wants Christ in there, the center of every motive, every goal, every thought process, every action. He wants Christ in there, formed in there, and also dwelling in that which he has formed until it is Christ in us the hope of glory. We don't have it yet. We hope for it. And so we continue in the hope, not moved away, taking heed to the ministry, taking heed as we, we studied the other night about false teachers, not falling for everything. Try the apostles. Listen, check the word. When you see that something is wrong, don't keep on with the thing. You have a brain, use it. Say, I must be doing something wrong. And stay with it until you're going on with the Lord. We make many mistakes. All of us make many, many mistakes. It's fine. There's no problem with mistakes. It's what we do about our mistakes that makes the difference between the overcomer and the loser. It's not that the overcomers don't make mistakes. It's what you do about them. And if you let them turn you to God and press you into God, then yet all things continue to work for good. We are being made the temple of God. We are not saved so that we go to heaven and do nothing. 
We are being made the temple of God. We are being made the dwelling place of God. And this is an invitation and an opportunity. It's not a shoe in It doesn't come automatically because you read it in the Bible. It doesn't come because you were baptized in water. Uh, it doesn't come uh, because you spoke in tongues. It comes in a long, slow process of, of line upon line and precept upon precept as something dies and something lives and something dies and something lives. Daily mortification, daily life as Christ takes the place of the Adamic nature. And there's no other way. And it's, it's usually not all that painful that we can't stand it unless we fasten on it and refuse to think about anything else. Yes, then, it, then the cross becomes unbearable. But if we recognize the fact that there's going to be a, a pain down here somewhere for a long part of our Christian life and just accept that we have a cross to bear and that's the way it is and that thing is the only thing that is ever going to drive us into Christ because once we get our way in things, the process stops because we don't have that driving us into God, driving us into God. So if you're pressing into God and God loves you, you're, you're going to have very few times when you really feel perfect. You go lay on the beach, something will bite you. That's right. There'll be something to keep you saying, God, God, because it's in that prayer as you're praying out of your pain that this thing that you desire above everything else is being formed in you. And there is no other way. And Christians that shortchange this process, that do not respond well to mistakes, that, that fumble around and manage out, fumble God and the church and the elders and everybody else and end up getting their own way, all they are doing is shooting themselves in the foot. They're only losing. You can't win. I used to say to the kids in the school, and it took them a while to get the point, but uh, I think it, it helped them to understand what was going on in the classroom. Yeah, I said, if, if I win, you win. If I lose, you lose. So quit resisting me. Because what I'm here is to help you. And if you defeat me, all you did was defeat yourself. So every time you outfumble me and don't learn something, I lose and you lose. You didn't accomplish anything. All you did was just stay dumb. You can't win apart from me because I'm devoted to your welfare. And God is devoted to your welfare. And if you outfumble God, all you did was outfumble yourself because he's devoted to your welfare. Because if he wins, you win, he wins. If God loses with your life, you lose. You lose together. So it's not easy, but it's not impossible if we are willing to not Fasten on the problems and the pain and think about the good things of the Lord. Keep a good, cheerful attitude. Rejoice and work righteousness. Make an effort to uh, come out of the doldrums. Now, it isn't going so great, but let me sit down and think for a moment here. The Lord is wonderful, and he's brought me out of things before, and he's going to bring me out of them again, and I'm going to take hope in the Lord. Maybe there's somebody who needs my help today. And I, if they see me and I'm all grousing around and bent out of shape, uh, then they're going to have to comfort me and actually uh, I should be comforting them. So we forget our pain. There's a lot of people that hurt in this world. And yet they manage to serve, don't they? And you know it. Maybe your parents hurt many, many times. And yet they put themselves out for your sake. And now God has required of us that we grow and we put ourselves out for others' sake and particularly for the Lord and his kingdom's sake. And instead of fasting on what we don't have, let's fasten on what we do have. And we'll make it fine. And God loves this. He loves a cheerful giver. He loves it when we rejoice and work righteousness. He loves that. And he says, straighten up your back and the hands that hang down. You haven't resisted unto blood. Just... God is chastening you because he loves you. And if you don't have chastening, you're not legitimate. You, you don't belong to the Lord because every son gets it. Praise the Lord. That's better. All right. Now, God is working his way in. It isn't going to take forever. It isn't going to take forever. You've only got a short time to put up with this stuff. Take heart. You've got a long time to live with the consequences of a very short life. A long time to live with the consequences of a very short life. Put your trust in God. 
Say, God, give me joy. Give me something out there before me so I can endure the cross. Help me to be a, a blessing to God and to other people. I can do it just fine, Lord, by your help. And God will take you on before you know it. God has brought you to the place where he wants you. And if you don't get the desires of your heart in this world, you get it in the next. That's right. Amen. Read the history of the Christian martyrs of the church. You'll find out that many of them died very young. They, they died serving the Lord. Do you think they've been left out or missed anything? Oh, no. Not Jesus. He's a king. He won't be in debt to anyone. He's on the giving side. And every pain that we suffer is good for us. And we proclaim him admonishing every man and teaching every man with all wisdom that we may present every man complete in Christ. We're not complete in Christ uh, by uh, imputation. We're made complete in Christ as the ministry labors and admonishes us and warns us and teaches us and rebukes us and loves us. And as the ministry cultivates around us and as, and as God bucks the rivets with experiences that, uh, that go along with the teaching that you're hearing, it's to make you perfect so you can be perfect before God and be filled with his glory. It's not imputed. It's a process. And for this purpose also, I labor, striving according to his power, which mightily works within me. So God, when you see it from God's standpoint, he's making for himself a house through which he plans on doing many things. All right, now we go to 2 Thessalonians. <clears throat> uh, this inner kingdom... The kingdom is within us. Someday it'll be external, but right now the internal part is being made, and that's the most important part. The internal kingdom is the important kingdom. The external is, is just a manifestation. The external kingdom, the one you can see when you see Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob sit down in the kingdom, the external kingdom is only a manifestation of the kingdom. The true kingdom is within us. It is God in Christ in us. And what is seen on the outside is only the manifestation of the inner reality. I know that's close to unity teaching. Nonetheless, it's true. And Jesus said it. And it's true. The kingdom is within us. And it is human nature. And that's why we have the big flap today of people hoping to flap their way up into heaven. The reason for that is because people want an external heaven. They want something that they can just go to and their problems are over. No, we are the kingdom. The kingdom is in the heart. It is God creating his will and his law in the human heart. That's the kingdom. The rest is a piece of cake. To manifest it is a piece of cake. But to create it, in a willful, stubborn human being is a majestic act which only God can perform. It's certain the preachers can. You're a very placid-looking group tonight. I guess you've been all beat down now. Huh? All right, now. In 2 Thessalonians, the first chapter. All right. In verse 10, when he comes, to be glorified in his saints. We don't think of the coming of the Lord as being a, uh, his glory revealed to the world from within people, but that's how it's going to happen. This is talking about the manifestation of the sons of God. The rapture teaching has completely obliterated the sense of this passage and of many similar passages, which exactly is Satan's intent. To occupy the people with an external thing that they can get by grace and by belief and say a simple doctrine like an incantation and then they practice the rapture by jumping up and down uh, hoping one day it will take, and off they'll go in their unconverted state. That was the purpose of that teaching, was to destroy the kingdom. 
will destroy the mean, the understanding of the scripture. The purpose of dispensationalism, the purpose behind that was to cut off Christian consciousness from the Old Testament and make the New Testament a kind of a mystery unrelated to the old because Satan knows very well that the strength of the Christian will come from the Psalms and from the prophets. And so with the teaching of dispensationalism and the rapture, he was able to cut the Christians off from the Jews, to cut the kingdom in half, so that part of it is up playing flutes up in la-la land, while the Jews are down here without the Holy Spirit setting up the kingdom. Satan loves la-la land, and he'd like to keep us all there. A master stroke. And most of the fundamentalists believe it today, it appears. At least evangelical fundamentalists do. A master stroke to destroy understanding, to cut the Bible in half, to cut the kingdom in half, and to get the people so that they're not, you can't warn them about trouble to come because they won't be here. It's brilliant. You've got to give the enemy credit. He's no fool. <laughs> and the people are saying, watch out that you're not deceived. How hell must laugh. Already to see. And preaching deception. There is no coming before this coming. There is no rapture before this coming. This is the resurrection and the ascension. The, any kind of a decent homiletical, exegetical study of First and Second Thessalonians, which I did in a book called The Day of Christ, the Messiah. By the way, which is a decent homiletical, lexicographical, exegetical study showing that Paul was not talking about two comings, using the simple technique that he only used one word for coming throughout First and Second Thessalonians. Only one Greek word. In every instance, the same Greek word. The parousia, the same word used by Jesus in Matthew 24 when he said that day will come after the tribulation of those days. I mean, it tells you. Say, I don't know when the rapture will be. Well, read Matthew 24. And they said, said what shall be the sign of thy parousia? And in 1 Thessalonians 4, Paul says, uh, uh, the parousia of the Lord, where is it? Uh, the coming of the Lord. Uh, where, where does it say in 1 Thessalonians 4, the coming of the Lord? Yeah. What? 15. The coming of the Lord. This is the parousia. It's the same word used in Matthew 24. What shall be the sign of thy parousia? This is the parousia. Every time the word coming is used in First and Second Thessalonians, it is the word parousia. Now I ask you, is the Holy Spirit going to teach us two different comings, give us no interpretation from, second, from First and Second Thessalonians, and use the same Greek word? Well, the response of the, quote, scholars of dispensationalism is, Paul was talking about uh, something that they knew it was a secret, so he didn't have to explain it. How do you like that approach to biblical interpretation? You can take any passage in the Bible and say anything you want to and say the reason it doesn't spell out here is because it's a secret and they already knew it. Anything you want to. No, it will not stand in any kind of a sober, decent, considered, conservative exposition, homiletical study, exegesis, uh, a word study or anything else comes to one conclusion. They are talking about one coming. In fact, a simple common sense context leads you to believe that it's one coming. Oh no, in order to prove the rapture, you've got to find two comings. That's terrible. It's a terrible heresy. And the only reason it got to gain the ground it has is because people have turned away from a philosophical, intellectual dealing. We have become experience-oriented people. We don't think 
And uh, the third world people are much more intellectual, much more uh, philosophical than Americans, and they're interested in this kind of thing. But Americans want something that is happy, sappy, flappy, takes no effort, and it sounds good, and it sounds right, and isn't that wonderful? But it isn't in the Bible. This is the rapture, and this is what it's like. Verse 10, when he comes to be glorified in his saints. Now, why is that? Why is he coming to be glorified in his saints? Why doesn't he come to take away his saints to heaven? What is wrong with this concept? The error, you know, is not whether it's mid-trib, post-trib, or pre-trib. There's no problem with that. That's, that's theological fussing. The problem is in the concept of escape and of the removal of the needed testimony from the earth. That's, it's the defeat, escape, flight that is wrong, not when it takes place. That's a quibbling for uh, eschatology. That isn't where the air is. That isn't going to hurt anybody. What hurts people is when they uh, have their mind on escape. But what do we see here? Do we see escape in verse 10? What do we see? Meeting Antichrist head on and destroying him. Well, look at verse uh, uh, 9. And these will pay the penalty of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power when he comes to be glorified in his saints. That is the rapture. My God shall crush Satan under your feet shortly. Romans 16, 20. Get it in your bones. When people talk to you about flying away, tell them, I'm not flying away. God is making me a vehicle through which he is going to destroy the wickedness out of the earth. That's a different concept. It's a concept of victory. The coming of the Lord is one of victory, not to rescue his little darlings so that they're not hurt with anything. If he did, it would be the first Christian group in history that he rescued because all the rest of them have been burned at the stake, uh, broken on the rack, uh, everything else you can think of, hung, decapitated, tortured. But his little darlings of the 1988s, they're too precious to be harmed in any way. We need guts and we need them badly. We're in a soft civilization. Death. Uh, and all kinds of physical problems of people are shielded away so we can't see them. So we live in this illusion that everything is nice. And so we can't stand going in the hospital because they have people there in all kinds of deformity and, and it stinks and it's a mess and we would prefer to keep that shielded so that we can't see it. So we are in a very unusual subnormal, abnormal, confused state of uh, which the television is the prime a culprit, and God wants us to grow up to realize that death is a normal part of living, that Christians have always been slaughtered for the gospel's sake, they're kind of the sheep for the slaughter, and at that time God will give us the grace and the strength, us and our kids, who are not scared half as much as we are, of doing what is right. And if we should be alive and remain when the Lord comes, it will not be with the soft, muted playing of a violin. As he whists away and his saints turn invisible, for which there is not a scripture, not even half a scripture, not even anything that says they're going to disappear. We're going to appear. The Bible doesn't say we're going to disappear. It says, when Christ who is our life shall appear, then shall ye disappear. <laughs> is that what it says, Joe? Joe says that's what it says. Colossians, the third chapter, he can prove it to you. When Christ who is our life shall appear, then shall you disappear with great glory. Do you stare at James like that, Joe? I don't know. <laughs> When Christ who is our life shall disappear, then shall you disappear with him. What a blessing for the world. All the Christians disappeared. And the buses all ran into each other and vans sold for $3,000 and it was wonderful. Oh, man. 
Oh, it's too rich for my blood. When he comes to be glorified in his saints on that day, which Paul, which day there, Paul, which day are you talking about? The one that is hidden or the one that isn't hidden? Which, which day? Uh, why didn't you say on those days? If there are two of them. Or why didn't you say comings of the Lord? If there are two of them. Why confuse us this way with number by just saying coming and day when we know everybody knows there's a secret in here? Oh, I don't know. When he comes to be glorified in his saints on that day, when Christ who is your life shall appear, then shall ye appear. And there is not one iota of scripture to say there's a coming of the Lord before his parousia, before his appearing. There is no scripture that says the Lord is going to appear before his appearing or come before his coming or that there will be a day before that day. There is no verse. So when people talk to you about the rapture, and then say, we're far out, just say, who is far out? That is a cultish, heretical, anti-Semitic doctrine. How do I give you some ammunition? Don't let them push you over. Hmm? When they want to know whether you're a man or a mouse, they pass the cheese, right? Yeah? <laughs> It's a wrong thing. All right. To be marveled at, for our testimony to you was believed. Now, what's going to happen in that day is, uh, well, two things. Two things are going to happen in that day. And that's the day of the Lord. That's the blessed hope of the church. That's the coming of the Lord. It's the kingdom of God. It's what all the prophets talked about. There's only one, there isn't two. One for the Gentiles and one for the Jews. Isn't that a dandy? Oh, what a masterpiece. All right, two things are going to happen. One, the Lord is going to roar out of Zion, as we saw here, and destroy the evil. And the second thing that is going to happen is the nations are going to believe. That's the second thing. Two things are going to result from the appearing. Now, nothing will happen from the disappearing. But from the appearing of the saints, two things are going to happen, all right? Is that all right? All right. Well, let's see. Well, what was the first one we said? Destroy the evil. Where? How? In what way? Oh, you're getting in generalities. I told you exactly how. I said the Lord would do what? He will roar out of Zion. Weren't you listening? What are you doing over there, Don? All right. Now, that's in Yoel, Joel. Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, Joel. In three, it's somewhere in the third chapter of Joel. Well, you say that this is not talking about the coming of the Lord. Well, it's talking about the coming of the Lord of Matthew 24, which in Matthew 24 is called the parousia, and 1 Thessalonians 4 is talking about the parousia, and 2 Thessalonians is talking about the parousia, so this is talking about what we're talking about. All right, in Joel chapter 3, verse 14, multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision. If you're in the valley of decision tonight, get out of the valley. Get up on one side or the other. Make up your mind. Because as the Lord draws near, it brings people to decision. Decision. And decision, that place is a valley and there's mountains on both sides. And you can't stay there forever. You've got to get out of it. But the day of the Lord will do that every time the Lord comes near you. He will bring you into the valley of decision. Every time. And you have to make a choice. And the more you pray and seek the Lord and the closer he comes to you, the more decision you have to make. It's a constant process of willing, deciding, deciding. Choose this day. Choose this day. Choose. Make a choice. You had a fork on the road. Choose. 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 Many of you had a fork in the road tonight. You're still making up. Should I? Shouldn't I? Should I? Shouldn't I? That's the coming of the Lord that forces that. It forces that. Before that, you're real bland and sweet and nice and a good 
uh, loving person. And then after that, you become cranky and mean and, and mentally disturbed because, <laughs> you're, because you can't make up your mind. All right. All right. The day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. The sun and moon grow dark. What does that remind you of? Matthew 24, the parousia. What shall be the sign of thy parousia? Well, this is it. There's, there's not going to be two times in history uh, when the sun and the moon grow dark and the moon turns to blood and all this, one for the Jews and one for the Gentiles. It's only going to happen once. Whenever you see that, that's the sign of the Lord's coming. It appears in Isaiah. It appears here and in other places. All right. The stars lose their brightness and the Lord roars from Zion. Now, we read in Hebrews 12 that we are come unto Zion, to the city of the living God, which comprises the spirits, it says, and the spirits of righteous men made perfect, and to the church of the firstborn. That is Zion. We are Zion, or which the, in Jerusalem portrays symbolically. And the Lord is going to roar from his people. See, when he's glorified in you, and utters his voice from Jerusalem. It isn't that the Lord is going to come down into the physical Zion in Jerusalem. He is, but he's coming down in his people. My God shall crush Satan under the Lord's feet. Isn't that wonderful? That is not what it says. What does it say? Under your tootsies. Mm. The Lord shall crush Satan under his feet. Aren't you glad for that? Well, you shouldn't be, because that is not what it says. What does it say? The Lord shall crush Satan under... <laughs> Isn't that wonderful? All right, it says, the saints will crush Satan under God's feet. What does it say? The saints will crush Satan under their own feet by faith and power. Put a hundred dollars in the offering. Are you all right, Hank? <laughs> I didn't finish it yet, Hank. A... He's afraid to drink it because he knows what is in it. My God, my God does the crushing. We don't. By faith and power, put $100 in the offer. We don't do it. My God shall. What? King James says bruise. The Greek word is crush. Crush, not just bruise. Crush. There's a difference between being bruised and being crushed. My God shall crush. You ever been bruised, Skip? You ever been crushed? There's a difference. All right. My God shall crush all the little demons. My God shall crush what? Satan, how under your feet, not under his feet, under your feet. So there you see the proper perspective, God working through the saints. That's the kingdom. That's the kingdom. He's not going to do it under his own feet. And we can't do it under our feet and we can't do it under God's feet. God is going to do it under our feet, because Genesis 3 has to be fulfilled. The seed of the woman shall bruise the serpent's head. So it has to be done under the feet of the seed of the woman, uh, which is Christ in the church. The church is the seed of the woman. All right, God is going to do that. My God shall do that. The Lord shall roar out of his church and be revealed in his church for the purpose of destruction. And the sinners shall be destroyed out of it. We turn to the book of Malachi. We say this in honor of Larry. 
who introduced us to this concept. All right. As to Malachi to the unlearned. All right. Uh, in Malachi chapter 4, <clears throat> For behold, the day is coming, burning like a furnace, and all the air. The day. Now, the scripture keeps saying, in that day, in that day. That's why Paul says, in that day. He's not talking about two different days. In that day, that day in the scripture is the day of the Lord. Not the days of the Lord, but the day of the Lord, the day that's coming. For behold, the day is coming, burning like a furnace, and all the arrogant and every evildoer will be chaff. And the day that is coming will set them ablaze, says the Lord of hosts, so that I will leave them neither root nor branch. But for you who fear my name, the Son of Righteousness will rise with healing in its wings, the Son of Righteousness, to heal us from unrighteousness. And you will go forth and skip about like calves from the stall. Don't you like that? Maybe just skipping about, just skipping about. All right, and you will, while you're skipping, notice, tread down the wicked, for they shall be ashes under the soles of your feet on the day which I am preparing, says the Lord of armies. That's one thing that will happen in the so-called rapture. It'll be rapturous for sure, but not, not raptured up into the air or into heaven, much less. All right, the second thing that will happen in that day is in Isaiah 60, and this is the good part. And this is fulfills what Jesus said, when we're one in the Father and he's in us and we're in him and we're in Jesus and Jesus is in the Father and we are in Jesus in the Father and the Father is in Jesus in us, then the world will believe. Huh? The world will believe. Don't you care about the world or do you want to become invisible? Do you want to become invisible or do you want to care about the world? I think the rapture is a tremendously selfish doctrine. Let the Jews go down here and do what they can without the Holy Spirit, and the rest of the world, we don't care what happens to that. They can have it and everything. But we are going up and do our religious heaven to do our religious number. I think I'd rather be here. I think it'd be more honesty and forthrightness, and I sure wouldn't want to leave the Jews in the lurch. Well, you can go up and play la-la if you want to, but I don't. I don't like it. I've been in religious la-la, and I don't like it. I'm afraid they'll have specials, and I don't want to listen. I don't want to listen. I had enough of that. Maybe they'll have cable TV up there with Christian programs. I don't want to be there. I'd rather be down here hassling, bassling with the Jews than up listening to specials. Of course, you do as you will, and maybe you like this stuff, but I don't. I just don't. I'm not naturally a social creature. I've just kind of been reconstituted that way. All right. In Isaiah chapter 60, Arise, shine, for your light is coming. What does it say in 2 Thessalonians? The Lord is glorified where? In his saints. This is what it's talking about. Your light has come. Thank God, finally. And the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. For darkness will cover the earth and deep darkness the peoples, but you will disappear. Praise God. Put $50 in the offering. <laughs> but the Lord will rise upon you. And of course, the people won't see that because we've disappeared. And his glory will appear upon you. And nations will come to your light. It doesn't mean a thing to us. It doesn't mean a thing to us. God did something for this poor old clodhopper on that verse, on that concept. And God gave me love for a nation. And then I understood. Then I understood what the Bible was about. Then I understood what the Bible was about. I thought I would croak. I don't like to cry. I am very humiliated and embarrassed when I cry. And I run until I get over it. I don't want people to see me crying. When, there were, when I was a boy in our neighborhood, you didn't cry. Unless you wanted to be called a sissy, and nobody wanted to be called a sissy. But all you did was get beat up all the time, so you just didn't cry. Was it that way in Camden? That's the way it was in West Haven, Connecticut. Yeah, it was that way. So I learned not to cry. But I 
I, I couldn't stop weeping. I didn't even know what I was weeping about, but I knew it had something to do with Iceland. I thought, what is happening to me in this forbidden looking environment when they want to make movies about the moon, they go to Iceland and because that's, it looks like the surface of the moon. I'm telling you the truth. It's a terrible place. It's, it's just the top of a volcano sticking out of the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. And here was this forbidden, forbidding looking place. And I couldn't stop crying. I wept and I cried. I said, God, what can I do to save this nation? Lord, if you will kill me, you do anything you want to, Lord. And God brought me to some hard decisions in those days, I'll tell you. I wore a crown of thorns and I said, it's all right if it's for Iceland. It's all right, Lord. It's okay. I'll bear this thing for you. I'll bear this thing for you. But God, you've got to do something for these people. And it was not a put on. I had, I didn't want to, I, I went there because I was tired and bored and Ole Olafson had to go back there for something. He says, will you go with me? And I thought, sure, what's the difference? I don't want to stay in anybody's home. That's all. I'm not, I don't want to be in anybody's home. We'll stay in a hotel. And uh, if that's agreeable with you, we'll go. But I'm not staying in anybody's home. I don't like to stay in people's homes. And uh, so he says, okay. So uh, we, we got there, and we got in, in a very fine hotel there. And all the smells were different, and the sights were different. And they were so different, I couldn't eat. And I felt sick, and, I, and the landscape was so barren, and the grass was all yellow because there isn't enough sun, and the air smelled of fish, and it was cold, and it was cloudy. It was a mess, and I was worse. And I thought, I, you know, talk. I wasn't homesick. I just couldn't eat. It was so strange. So I got a Swiss chocolate candy bar, and I ate that. And I thought, w when will this end? And I was counting the days when I go back home. We were there for about a month. I thought, well, you can tough on anything for a month. I'll just hang it out every day. That'd be it. Just wait for the month to be over. So uh, the pastor came to see us in the hotel room with the assistant pastor. The pastor is, is, comes from a, a Weeking family. That's a Viking family, of which he's very proud. And so he told me later, he said, I was supposed to preach there. And he says, I took a look at this man. I said, he can't preach. He's sick. <laughs> I, I was. Well, this man, his name is Anar. He's used to having his own way. And he's, a, he's about this wide. And, and he's an ex-fishing uh, boat captain. And you know, he's one of these big, hairy guys. And, and uh, so he's used to having his way. You know. So he comes in and he says, you shall not stay here. You shall not stay here. He says, you shall not stay here. You're coming to our home. You shall not stay here. It is not Icelandic hospitality. So I thought, oh, here we go. And uh, somebody's home. So... It was Sunday afternoon, we sat down to eat, and I thought, what is this? Well, the, he, this man has a tremendous sense of humor. So he, so he saw what was going on. So instead of comforting me, you know, that it was lamb, he begins to describe what part of the lamb that it was, and it wasn't very nice. <laughs> Which he found very droll and amusing, but I was not amused at the... At the trying to eat. I mean, I had to eat. All I'd had was a chocolate bar for two days. And so I was looking at a lamb's, what, you know, unmentionable. <laughs> so he had a good time. And I finally got out of there and went in the room, which the family had uh, turned out the, the children so there'd be a room for me. So I'd have my own room. And I, you know, I mean, they did everything possible they could to make me comfortable while they were laughing at me, but it was all right. <laughs> I am not going to, to make it here, but if I'm here, I'm here. And, and there was a complete language barrier. They're all jabbering. And Ole's no help because he can talk Icelandic, so he's talking Icelandic. And so here I am, isolated by language. I don't know what they're doing. They're shooting glances at me, and God knows what they were saying. This is supposed to be the preacher. Two services a day, back to back, for six days a week. I'm in fine shape. Well... Somewhere, and so I thought I'm going to spend the whole time in prayer. This is why I just spend the whole time in prayer. This is great. I can pray. I can't understand them, but I, this is wonderful. They won't expect anything out of me. I'll just pray all day. So this, this will be fine. I can fast and pray. I don't have to worry about the food. So some 
at some point, I don't know what happened. I, I, I don't know whether God baptized me in the Holy Spirit or whether I had some kind of a very, very prolonged jet lag or what went off in my being, but it was, all I, all I, I just felt like I was on fire. Every circuit in my body was on fire and I was an emotional wreck. I was an absolutely, I couldn't look at the people without weeping. I don't know what they thought of me. I couldn't preach. I was trying to weep and preach and assure the people. I said, I am not homesick. And, and I, you know, I didn't want to think I was such a baby. You know, yeah, I li listened to the Marine Corps when I was 17 in Paris Island when I was 17. I wasn't homesick then. I'm not going to be homesick. Here I am 50. I'm, I'm not going to be homesick. But I knew something was wrong, and, and the preacher was worried and concerned about me, and with re reason, you know, but I couldn't give him any, any answer. But as I went and prayed, I, I thought, God, what is this about the nations? And this began to live for me. It began to live for me. And I understood then what Calvary was about, and I understood what the gospel was about. And I said, Lord, I, I see now, I see the central, the central thought that I see what motivates God and I see what motivates Christ. I understand it. And I understood at that time that there is no inheritance that is worth anything except people. You can't look at this. The nations come to you. What is it? It's nations, you know, unwashed people. You ever see some of these tribes? You know, you know that some of the tribes in South America, uh, I don't know whether they're from Papua New Guinea or something. We saw them uh, on the television years ago when we watched this crazy stuff. And, and, and here, here these tribes are coming up for conference. And, you know, as they're going through the jungle, they hop on their right foot for a, a kilometer or so. And they hop on their left foot like they had good sense. And, and we were looking at another one in which uh, the people, uh, and here they are stark naked, and they're all on one side of the village, and then the whole mass of them run over like a bunch of buffalo to the other side of the village. And then when they finish that, then they all run, and they go back and forth on this. And I saw one fellow, and he was dancing. He danced himself into an absolute sweat. And his wife came out and very carefully mopped all the perspiration off him, and he went on dancing. And this was what he did in place of work. And I thought, he has no New England work ethic here. I, I don't understand all these people. And this is how they're going to come, moving back and forth in mass, stark naked, and hopping on one foot and then on the other, and spending their time dancing, and they're coming to you. I mean, and here, what you want is a mansion. I mean, you had it picked out. And here's all these things. It doesn't sound very appealing, does it? But the Bible says, Lift up your eyes round about and see. They all gather together. They come to you. They're not coming to the Lord. They're coming to you because Christ is in you. Not only to destroy, but to love and to build. Your sons will come from afar. Are there relationships? If there are no relationships in the kingdom, <laughs> it isn't going to make much sense. It doesn't say the things shall come from far. Your sons will come from far. And your daughters will be carried in the arms and you will see and be radiant and your heart will thrill and rejoice because the abundance of the sea will return to you. You know what you're going to feel within you? You're going to feel the love of Christ and every nerve in your body will be burning and you will not be able to talk to them for weeping. And the Father whose love is greater than all will be in your heart, in Christ who is in your heart. And you'll hold out your arms and you'll say, God has given me these. He has divided the spoil with the strong. God has given me children. And God has given me young men and women. And God has given me old men and old women. God has given me an inheritance. And you look into their face, and instead of seeing these crazy outlandish cultural things they do, you will see people 
but you'll see the integrity that God sees in them and the worth of a human being. And your heart and the love of God in you will reach out and you'll embrace them and you'll look up to God and say, thank you, Father. You've given me the greatest gift of all. Listen, one human being, one human being is worth more to Jesus than ten heavens. You'll never understand it till God does it for you. Paradise doesn't mean a thing. Heaven doesn't mean a thing. It is people. 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 Shall we stand? I thank you, Father, that you have kept the good wine until now, Lord. And our minds have been hidden, as it were, as we have wrestled with the nuts and bolts of redemption. But Lord, for a brief moment tonight, you've given us a little glimpse of what's ahead and where it's all going. And it's all going to people. And it's all going to God's love in us, in his priesthood, in his saints, reaching out and embracing mankind. And I praise you for that, Lord. I praise you for that, that we might know the love of Christ which passes knowledge and be filled with all the fullness of God. And Lord, you said, I have loved you and the Father has loved me. Continue in my love. And I pray tonight, Lord, for each one of us that you will awaken us to what is ahead, to the, not only the destruction of sin out of the earth, but the receiving of people for our inheritance. I thank you for that, Lord. I know and you have taught me that one person is worth more than any number of heavens. Just one person. And I know that that's how Jesus views each human being that is called into his bride. The love is incredible. It is unbelievable. It is impossible for us to contain. But we know someday, Lord, by your strength, we are going to contain that love. And we're going to reach out and we're going to bring mankind right into the, your, the very heart of God. Oh, hallelujah, Father. It is so right and so wonderful. Let's just praise him. Hallelujah. Lord, we praise you. We praise you, Lord, for what is ahead for your church. We praise you, Lord, for what is ahead for the temple of God. We praise you, Lord, for what is ahead for those who allow you to work your works in their heart, Lord. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah.